This is the second video in our series on momentum, and this video is going to be on impulse and force time graphs. Impulse is a change in momentum. It's the literal number amount that momentum changes by in an object. It's also equal to the final momentum of an object minus the starting momentum that the object has. And because it's a change in momentum, the variable for impulse is just delta p. Delta, that triangle symbol, just means a change in. That's used a lot in math to mean a change. And the units of impulse are newton seconds, so just like momentum itself, impulse is also measured in newton seconds. Usually a change in a variable is measured in the same unit as the variable itself. I'm going to imagine that I have a positive direction to the right and a negative direction to the left, and I have a bowling ball hitting this pin. So if this bowling ball has a starting mass of 5 kilograms and an initial velocity of 5 meters per second, I can see that the momentum that it starts with, P0, is going to equal positive 25 newton seconds, because it's the mass times the velocity. So when it hits this pin, I'm going to pretend that it leaves the pin traveling at only 3 meters per second. So if it's only traveling at 3 meters per second, and I multiply that out, I find that the final momentum of the ball is 15 newton seconds. So the impulse is the change in momentum. So if it went from positive 25 down to positive 15, I can see that the change in the momentum is going to be negative 10 newton seconds. So the impulse on the ball is negative 10 newton seconds. So that's the meaning of impulse. And impulse, just like everything else with momentum, is dependent on which direction we're considering positive and negative. If I switch this around so left is considered positive and right is considered negative, that means that both velocities of the ball will be negative, which means that both momentums of the ball will be negative. And if I change the momentums of the ball to be negative, it's going from negative 25 to negative 15. That means that the impulse is now positive 10, because negative 15 minus negative 25 is positive 10. So just like with momentum itself, the sign for impulse, whether it's positive or negative, depends on which direction we're considering to be positive and negative. So impulse also has a direction. The equation for impulse is a little surprising. The equation is actually not just the final momentum minus the initial momentum, it's also equal to the net force on the object multiplied by the time that force is applied. I've left a proof above my head of why that is. I'm also going to prove it to you with the same ball example. So let's say that we have the same bowling ball and it's rolling at 25 newton seconds. And this time we want to understand how much impulse it feels from this force time equation. So I'm going to imagine that we have a force of negative 5 newtons applying to the ball for 2 seconds. Now I know that if this is the net force on the ball, net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And I have the mass of the ball, that's 5 kilograms. So if I plug this into F equals ma, negative 5 newtons is equal to ma, so that's equal to 5 kilograms times a. So that means that the acceleration of the ball is negative 1 meters per second squared here, as it's slowed for 2 seconds. Plugging this into a SUVAT table, if it starts with a velocity of 5, like it does in this situation, and it's slowed at a rate of 1 meter per second squared um, for 2 seconds, because that's the total time of the collision, the final velocity of the ball, calculating this out, is going to be 3 meters per second. So if the final velocity of the ball is 3 meters per second, that means that the final momentum of the ball is 15 newton seconds, because it's the mass multiplied by the velocity. So you'll notice that just by using the properties of the net force and the time and kinematics, I was able to predict the final momentum of the ball without even knowing that impulse equation. So what this new equation is doing is telling us that instead of having to do all that kinematic stuff that I just did, I can just take the net force times the time, and that will be equal to the impulse. So this equation is telling us that the impulse is negative 5 times 2, which is negative 10. So it's telling us that if we apply a force of negative 5 newtons for 2 seconds, the ball is going to change by negative 10 newton seconds. So if it starts at 25 newton seconds, it goes down to 15 newton seconds. So I was able to use that equation just by plugging in force times time without having to bother with the kinematics. So this is kind of a shortcut to understanding the final velocity and final momentum of an object. So this same impulse can occur with different forces in different times. This could have also occurred with a force of negative 10 newtons for one second. And if you plug that back into the kinematics, you'll actually find that that still predicts the final velocity to be three meters per second. And if you plug in one newton of force and a time of 10 seconds, that will also predict a final velocity of three for a total impulse of negative 10. So I can just keep replacing these values and all these different values come up 
with the same impulse. So multiple forces and multiple times can combine to make the same total impulse. Impulse was actually how Newton originally wrote his second law of motion. He actually originally wrote it as force is equal to the change in momentum over time which is just a rewriting of the equation above. If you multiply that original Newton's second law by the time, you get force times time is equal to the change in momentum. And today we usually write it as F equals MA, but the two statements are actually identical to each other. So that's just an interesting historical fact and another origin of that equation for impulse. I'm gonna do a few example problems of calculating impulse. I'm gonna start with example problem one. A thousand kilogram car is moving at 30 meters per second, and if its engine puts 5,000 newtons of force forward on the car for three seconds, how fast will it be moving at the end? So writing down what we know, I know the mass, the initial velocity, the time, and the net force. And I also know that the impulse is equal to the final momentum minus the original momentum, and it's also equal to the force times the time. I can calculate the original momentum by just multiplying the mass times the velocity, and when I do that, that's equal to 30,000 newton seconds. So plugging in what I know, I find that the final momentum minus 30,000 newton seconds is equal to 5,000 newtons times 3 seconds. So doing the math, I find that the final momentum is 35,000 newton seconds. And I know that the final momentum is equal to the mass times the final velocity, so dividing out the mass, I get a final velocity of 35 meters per second. So that's an example of using impulse to solve a problem. Example number two says a person on a bike with a total mass of 80 kilograms is moving at 20 meters per second. And if they want to slow to five meters per second in five seconds, how much force do they need to apply with their brakes? Again, writing down what I know, I have the mass, the initial velocity, the final velocity, and the time. So that actually allows me to calculate the initial momentum and the final momentum just by multiplying the mass by the initial velocity and the final velocity. So plugging this into my impulse equation, I find that 400 newton seconds, the final momentum, minus 1600 newton seconds, the initial momentum, is equal to the net force times five seconds. Solving for the net force by itself gets me negative 240 newtons, and it makes sense that it's negative because the brakes would be applying a force in the opposite direction of the positive motion of the bike. So this is another example of using impulse to solve for missing info. I'll give you one more. A 500 kilogram car is driving at 10 meters per second. If its brakes can apply 1,000 newtons of force, how much time will it take to stop? So I know the mass of the car, I know the initial velocity is 10, and I also know the final velocity is zero because it's trying to come to a stop. And the net force on the car is going to be negative 1,000 newtons because if I'm considering the forward motion to be positive, the brakes are applying a backward force, so I have to consider that backward force to be negative. Plugging this into my impulse equation, I can find that the initial momentum of the car multiplying the mass times the velocity is 5,000 newton seconds, and the final momentum is just zero because it's at rest. So zero minus 5,000 newtons is equal to the net force times the time. Solving this out for time, I get that the time is equal to five seconds. So if you're driving that car at that rate and you can apply that much force, this is the amount of time that it would take to stop the car. We'll now move on to the second part of this lecture, which is on force time graphs. There's a reason why I have this in here as well. It's related to impulse. A force time graph shows the net force applied on an object on the graph's y-axis and the time that the force is applied for on the x-axis. The area under the curve of a force time graph is equal to the impulse on the object. So the reason why this is the case is that if I draw this line for a constant force applied over a certain amount of time, and then draw the area under the curve, that's just the area between the line and the x-axis. I can see that this is a rectangle with a height that's equal to the total force being applied, like that top number on that green line would be the force applied and the bottom number is zero, so the length of that green line is just the total force applied, and the width of the rectangle is just the total time that is passed. So because the area is the height times the width, here it's gonna be the force times the time, which we know is equal to the change in momentum, which is equal to the impulse. These can look a little complicated, but it never gets much more complicated than solving for triangles and rectangles. So here, if I wanted to know the total change in momentum of this object as this non-constant force is applied to it, I just have to find the total area under the curve. So this is a right triangle, so that's easy to calculate. It's just one half base times height, so I can see that that would be 10 newton seconds, one half times five times four, 
and then the area of this rectangle would be equal to 25, so that's an additional 25 newton seconds of impulse. And then this shaded region would be plus 10. And then anything under the x-axis is considered negative, and I'm going to draw that between the line and the x-axis still. So this is what that final area would look like, but this is adding a negative impulse to the object. So that last one would actually be equal to negative 6 because it's 3 times negative 4 times 1 half. Adding all those areas together gets me a total impulse of 39 newton seconds on the object. Here's an example problem where this would come up. A person in a 1000 kilogram car presses on the gas pedal more and more and uniformly increases the force of the engine on the car from 0 newtons to 2000 newtons over 8 seconds. If the car has a velocity of 12 meters per second to start, how fast will it be going after those 8 seconds? So I'm going to use the fact that the total change in momentum is the final minus the initial, and I know that the initial momentum is the mass times the initial velocity, which is equal to 12,000 newtons. And I know from the problem that the car is applying a force starting at zero and going to 2,000 over 8 seconds, so this is what the force time graph would look like. And so the area under that curve is going to be equal to 8,000 when I multiply that out, because it's just one half base times height, so one half times the base of 8 times the height of 2,000 gets me 8,000 as a result. So the impulse is equal to the final minus the initial momentum, so that's going to be 8,000 is equal to the final minus 12,000 newton seconds. So solving that, the final momentum of this object is going to be 20,000 newton seconds, so that's the final momentum of the car, and solving for the velocity using momentum is equal to mass times velocity gets me a final velocity of 20 meters per second. So this is actually something that we weren't able to do before in class. Before, we could only deal with constant forces in equations, forces that weren't really changing. We couldn't really do any math with constantly changing forces, but now we can have a force that is constantly changing and still predict the motion of the object using the force time graph and our new definition of impulse.